set. This is really just competitive, but but it, but it's infinite. It's infinite, right. uh, and, you know. And that's that's one of the things that Bob Marley talked about was uh, like wealth. He says wealth is is like an, it's the ocean. It's literally the ocean. It's just frequencies, waves back and forth, and whenever you need something, just go grab buckets full. <laughs> it's abundant. It's exactly. always going to be there. Exactly. And, yeah. And that's the same with information. You know, it's abundant. We mm -hmm. just got to share it. And uh, and it's one of those things, bro. Like if, if a society isn't better off. With with wealth, a little bit of wealth. If if all your neighbors are wealthy, then nobody's hungry. That's going and, and robbing stores. You know, no, nobody's looking for for drugs. You know, like, uh, so like, why wouldn't you everybody to be wealthy? Mm -hmm. and you want everybody to be successful, of course. And all it takes is you know more people to think about. I I, I think as far as uh you know the business aspect of it in, in society, the people that are ahead are the people that are solving problems for other people. So it's just, it's, it's all about helping each other. So there's something called the strangest secret. Have you heard of that? No. You heard of it? Tell me about it. So a guy named Earl, Earl Nightingale, oh, uh, yeah. long past, but uh, he started the movement of this uh, self-development movement and stuff like that. But uh, he has a book, it's, it's, an, it's available on YouTube uh, to listen, but it's called the, uh, the Strangest Secret. And he says, what's strange about the secret is that it's, it's obvious and it's, it's the secret to wealth. Mm. And what he talks about is solving problems for others is how you get wealthy, but it's also uh, providing a value, providing a service. You know, I think a lot of times we're thinking that uh, the the secret to wealth or getting rich is by working more hours or trading time for money. And uh, while I, I don't discard it because that should be a stepping stone, it could be a stepping stone. Right. I mean, not should be, but could be a stepping stone. I believe in shortcuts, man. <laughs> I, I believe. I believe that if if you have if you have the secret to success that, or or if you have a formula that worked for you, why wouldn't I emulate that? Why would I say, oh man, you know, you know, Andres is is, uh, is running eight hundred. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna start, uh, right? You know, from baby steps. No, I, maybe I can start. Of course, and that's halfway a, there. Or that's the beauty there. of it. That's that's why I thought about it. Um, you know, about uh this podcast. Like, why not? You know, talk about. And, and talk to uh, these leaders, talk about uh, their past, because isn't that um, what we learn about all these books about self growth and everything? You know, talk about mentors. The, the mentor program is pretty much that. You know, see their path, see how um, how these people move and, and what they did, and maybe you can apply that to your path and you know skip a few steps exactly. and or even uh, skip them, but um, be more effective. Program. It's a exactly. blueprint that you could easily follow, and exactly. uh, it, it, you're hitting something on that because right. um, if the steps are already laid out, like why why not follow those uh, follow those steps? And that, that that is the beauty of of mentors. And I think that uh, a lot of times it's, it's weird in our society, but we think we got to do it on our own, and we think that uh, that we got to power through, and mm -hmm. we got to keep our goals a secret, and don't tell don't tell anybody what we're trying to accomplish or what we're trying to do. And we just make things much harder on ourselves, completely unnecessarily, mm -hmm. where you can reach out to somebody that has a blueprint that you can follow. Maybe they'll even uh, give you a hand along the way. I feel like it's more, you know, from, from my uh, uh, experiences, I've noticed that a lot of people want to share uh, their journey and a lot, of, a lot of people are willing to, to help out, you know. You just um, gotta ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all about asking. Uh, we, I feel like we, um assume a lot of uh of outcomes in life you know and that goes broader but you know um pretty much in in what we're talking about you know we assume that this mentor or this um company ceo is going to shut us down and maybe they're you know what i remember when i was in his shoes yeah. um i was young you know i get a lot of those when i'm out there trying to open you know sales or or, uh, or clients um for my businesses you know like Hey man, like, I, I like you a lot. You know, I was there. Um, I got to, I got to, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I like what I see. So um, definitely, um, I, I, I agree with uh, with that statement. Um, I think uh, now not everybody's gonna be super receptive. I've been, um, I've been the recipient of where uh, I'm looking to provide value to what I perceive as a mentor. Um, you know, so I'm uh, doing work for them, uh, pro bono, 
just to learn the ropes and uh, you know spending a lot of time with them and then realizing that when you start climbing this invisible ladder right uh, and all of a sudden your competition so I have run into that man it's, it's unfortunate it's uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an emotional guy so it's a little bit heartbreaking for me because like, man like I'm trying to be like you why would you right. why would you you know throw an elbow at me so it's like um uh, yeah, I, I guess you do have those stages. Pretty much like track and field when, uh, it's few. what was that? I have it in my mind, but I don't have the same exact phrase, but when your idols become your, uh... Your, or your peers. Yeah, 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 something like that. I, I, I forgot the phrase, but yeah, pretty much, um, they, there, they, they become your, your, your competitors. Yeah. But there's beauty if, uh, if it's not, if it's not, uh, with bad intentions. There's beauty in competition. Because mm -hmm. uh, competition is necessary. Like if right. uh, in this particular instance, had he said, "Hey, let's make a race," like, "Hey, not, now that you're at this level, let's make a race for who gets to the next level," or right. something like that. And that could be a friendly competition where we help each other out, and I discover something and I say, "Hey, man, this is this is what's working for me," or vice versa. I think that's that that's awesome. That's beautiful. But in, in, no, right. said, yeah, I don't think Apple would have been Apple without windows or uh or microsoft or and i don't think microsoft would have been microsoft without, without apple you know and, and, and they did get along at a certain point but you know exactly. they, they did collaborate exactly so. and it's i you know that com competitive uh, nature is what gets us ahead exactly know? yeah Com competition is, is awesome it's, for yeah. sure as long as it's not as long as that unhealthy right? oh no yeah, yeah so talking about uh your uh your path you started as an engineer right yeah, yeah. Uh, so what I do now is I run a private equity firm, mm -hmm. uh, which is an investment firm. And is a, it's like an alternative banking uh, type of system where we get investors uh, funds and then we deploy those funds into different projects. In the last four or five years, it's been commercial real estate, uh, specifically multifamily apartment complexes. And now that uh, the economy is, is switching, there's a different frequency going on, right. we're pivoting uh, to more direct lending, what's called debt. Uh, but yeah, I started, that's where I am today, right. 2023, where I started was in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, I, I was always fascinated by wires, by sound, really music. I was trying to be a sound engineer at some mm. point. So uh, for me, it was music, lighting. So you started uh, thinking um, that you wanted to be into the music industry. Yeah, 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah, I was. Uh, um, I, I was those guys that was in the early reggaeton movement. Oh. In the early hip hop movement. Gotcha. Uh, like late eighties, early nineties, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I used to be the uh, the cam the camerographer. Yeah. Uh, for concerts, you know, they would do these garage concerts, uh, and and I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> and I'd be the guy you know, filming. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so. Um, Music was a passion. I, right. You know, I played the trumpet. I love jazz, and uh, so that's what I was trying to get into. That I realized that I wasn't a good rapper. So <laughs> I wasn't gonna. It wasn't gonna be singing. <laughs> Plus, I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little. Uh, I'm a little shy too, so I can't be on stage. Yeah, right? yeah. I don't want to be on stage singing at least. It's funny because I'm on stage now, <laughs> but uh, it's different now. Right. right. Uh, uh, but yeah, so, so I wanted to get into the sound. I wanted to get into sound engineering. Uh, I did the full sale. I tried to get into full sale. I was accepted, but couldn't figure out how to uh, how to get in it because I was also at, at that point. I'd already started my engineering career as well, my mm -hmm. engineering studies. When did you, um, I guess, start making that uh, that decision that you might have to look away from the music um, industry? I think it was. Uh, well, I don't think I know. It was the money, the money situation. So mm. uh, at the time, it was like uh, I can go to. Uh, university here for free with scholarships and grants and whatnot right uh, or I can go this route and their numbers are like half of what my house costs at the time wow I was, inflation is crazy now mm -hmm. but we're talking about 20 years ago or something. right, right, right. and uh, 25 years ago Ooh. and uh, yeah so that that's really was the deterrent it's like man I could do this uh, it's funny because it's funny how we're hitting on the music but uh, um, I used to do mixtapes as well and oh, yeah. I was doing a digital mixtapes. I was doing MP3 and in uh, in the CDs back when we used to like even mm -hmm. pirate the CDs. Yeah. Uh, in college, so we're talking 2000, 2001, 2002. 
uh, I would be making, uh, I made a ton of mixtapes and I used to hand those out at parties or like the Car uh, Caribbean Association. You were full on. Yeah. 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 yeah so that, awesome. was, that was a lot of fun, man. But yeah, from there, uh, uh, went straight into engineering and then from uh, my career in, in, in engineering it took me to, I wanted to do power. I love power, lighting and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, it took me to the theme parks, took me to uh, Walt Disney World. So I, I was a third party contractor. You were here all along in Orlando the whole time, man. Oh, perfect spot. Dude, uh, they say there's no coincidences, man. Uh, but I can tell you that when I graduated college in 03, uh, I couldn't find a job. Because everything was, like the job market was, was nuts then. It was, uh, uh, there, w there wasn't a lot of hiring. Uh, I, I think I sent out like 100 resumes. I did interview a couple places out of state. Uh, it's, I have a funny story. I interviewed one time in Connecticut and uh, the, the day I was there, there was a snowstorm. So <laughs> had they got me in summer, you know, we might have a different story here. Yeah. <laughs> but they got me in a snowstorm. Uh, but, you don't do snow. <laughs> no, no, man. We're Caribbean. We're Islanders. What do you want to No, man. Um, but uh, um, I have a friend that uh, that was a, an instructor at the electrical trade uh, where electricians train at that school. And I went over over there to him and I was like, hey man, I just graduated my engineering degree. Uh, I'd love to get into this industry and I don't mind starting from the ground up. You know, I'll start with the shovel and work my way up. Gotcha. And he said, yeah, that's cool, uh, you know, sign up. So I applied for the school and, and, and it's one of those like re all rejections aren't rejections. Sometimes the door closes and a window opens mm -hmm. or another door opens. Uh, um, he had told me, hey, you don't qualify because you don't have the required math. And I was like, bro, I did an engineering degree right. and I was one class away from a minor in math. Mm. So like, yeah, you're like, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so that it, it, it was because the word algebra wasn't anywhere in my transcripts um, because I had taken that in high school. Right. I'd taken all advanced math in college. But it was a good rejection because I'm like, man, I, so I sat down at the lobby. I was like, what am I going to do now? Curveball, man. Curveball. And then yeah. there, was, there was a magazine that, that talked about um, uh, contract, electrical contractors doing work at theme parks at Walt Disney World. Mm. So I, I got that and I reached out to every single person that was interviewed and that's and, uh, I ended up getting uh, my foot in the door that way. One of those guys hired me. Wow. Yes, and I was with them for 18 years. You just cold emailed them? Cold, yeah, cold email, uh, yeah. And then just... A lot of people don't know the power of a uh, just cold email, man. Yeah, you just gotta do it, man. Like, just cold emails, cold calls. Yeah. <laughs> just go out there and put yourself, you know, in that, uh, that situation. Where, did you um, right away uh, start Working on in the theme parks, like which yeah. ones did you? Um... Yeah, right away I got hired for a project called Soren at Epcot. Oh, I know Soren. Yeah, so uh, I came in as a project engineer. Uh, basically, the guy does all the data mm -hmm. and uh, and worked my way up from there. And then uh, through the 18 years, I did some amazing projects. I led amazing teams. Uh, one of the things that I discovered about halfway through my career, uh, I mean, it was always there, but about halfway through my career, I realized, man, there's a big race disparity disparity between. Uh, management and the field mm -hmm. and here in Central Florida it's uh, a lot of Latinos and, uh, and some African Americans mm -hmm. uh, but it was heavy minority in, in the labor market and but in management and upper it's a lot of Anglo mm -hmm. and uh, I, was, I was already breaking stereotypes without knowing I was breaking stereotypes right. uh, I just what, got hired and was just doing a job and I, and I was wondering man why is everybody coming up to me and, and, and you know wanting to be my friend and, and you know and why am I getting all this support? <laughs> Just the duty of the clipboard. Did you feel that there was something different in the way you uh, looked at things or, or work? Yeah. Did you, or, you know, effort-wise, or maybe um, you, had, you had a vision that maybe they liked, or what were, yeah. what were they, uh, what made you stand out from the rest of uh, the Latino? And that's, uh, um, I think about that a lot, man, because uh, like sitting where I'm sitting today, it's like, man, I'm so blessed but it was really with the right mentors and, and mm. it goes right back to that and the right people, man. And uh, uh, the person that hired me that owned the company, still owns the company, um, man, there was an energy about him. He was just, he was really uh, an inclusive guy. Uh, he didn't tolerate any racism or sexism or any discrimination of any kind. 
because in his mind it, it, it didn't exist it, it didn't exist and it didn't register yeah it didn't mm -hmm. register mm -hmm. and for him it's like man like you have an amazing talent i want you uh and and, and find more people like you mm -hmm. <laughs> that, right. are, that are successful yeah. and um uh so I, I i took that to heart i took that message and that's really what i embodied and um so i just feel that um i gave everybody a fair shot uh, regardless of what rank you were or regardless of what creed or race or ethnicity or whatever and uh, I think that is what was the uh, at least that was my blueprint or the secret for me was um, listen to everybody everybody's got it kind of like um it spread to, uh, to you his his uh, philosophy exactly. pretty much and you guys were always in contact through throughout your journey even um, now uh, yeah. uh, I meet with him quarterly Wow. So yeah, so this guy's a, a ultra successful uh, a businessman and family man. Mm -hmm. uh, when I had my daughter, my first born, he called me and uh, and, and he regulated. Like he basically said, hey man, um, you need to leave the office and you need to take your two to four weeks, however long it takes for Lupita to get healthy. Right. Before you come back, you need to focus on, on your family. Uh, because I made the mistake and didn't focus on mine when my daughter was born. So, so he's... You know, so again, going back right. to mentors, man, people that change your life. Mm -hmm. And in this case, he, uh, uh, his wisdom was a failure as a father, getting success in the business. And then he realized, man, that was, I had it backwards. So he, he, but he gave me that, he gave me that advice. But so uh, somebody like that, uh, I definitely want to embody and, and emulate. It's almost like he himself is breaking stereotypes yeah. of the, the, um, the CEO and the employee, you know, yeah. it's it's like the the philosophy of remember that you they don't work for you, you work for them, you know, as as yeah. a CEO. He, yeah, he, he used to say that a lot too because uh, um, eventually, eventually you do, man. And in the electrical uh, construction trade, you rely on the guys in the field, the people that are doing the installation, and um, and because that's your biggest liability too. So you learn to manage risk. Mm. Uh, but I, I, the way I saw it was, man, if they're part of the team, if we can create a culture where we're a team, right. then we're all going to succeed and we're all going to be on the same page. Because it used to be like the office and then the field and we only give them limited information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like groups, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, uh, so I, I started breaking that down by including them. I, man, I, I, I created so many innovations. They gave me so much freedom. Uh, I was I was unchecked for a long time, man, just uh, because I was producing and I was providing results. Uh, but I became basically like this anomaly, mm. and uh, um, I had incredible success. Uh, but when, going back to your question, what I think was a, a key differentiator was that once I, I started including, I started creating team atmosphere and uh, I started getting rid of people that didn't meet that vision. Mm -hmm. and I just, that there was times, man, I, I, um, I was controversial, man. I ended up uh, getting rid of or firing for... To avoiding the word firing, but no. not firing. Uh, that's, that's for a game, man. You know, some yeah. legends, man. Some people that were like, hey, this guy was in the industry for 45 years. How dare you fire him? Because he didn't fit the vision mm -hmm. and he was bucking the system. And, uh, and from there, I, I started identifying uh, potential future leaders and I started creating leaders from the teams that I was building. And a lot of them look like me, look like me and you. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, uh, I don't know if that's by coincidence or not. But I started giving opportunities. I ended up creating uh, like a whole Latino, uh, a whole army. <laughs> it, was, like, it's, it, was, it was pretty, it was a lot of fun, really intense. Uh, we did really cool shit. And uh, what was your uh, most memorable or the, the project you really liked uh, working on? Right now it's Tron. You know, uh, oh, really? Tron, that was my project, that was my baby. That one, uh, complete innovation there as well. Uh, so, that was the first project, and it probably is still going to be that. I'm sure the record's going to stand for a while. But oh, yeah, it, it was a. I, I think I, I didn't uh, get the chance to, to get on it, but that was all the, oh, it's dope. the news and videos, TikToks everywhere. That's it's a dope ride. Right? Yeah. And uh, the innovation that I did was I created a 100% um, pre, pre designed uh, installation. Uh, basically construction projects. So in other words, I had a team of drafters of engineers 
designing every single because in the in the commercial electrical industry, uh, all the wires go in pipes. So you have to create a pipe system. Man, we pre-designed every system of that building, wow. uh, of the whole attraction. Pre-designed everything. Uh, so it was it was basically you just handed the electricians and director said, hey, follow this, color coded, you know, uh, has legends. Just follow this, uh, and and you'll be successful. And it, it was an experiment, dude. It was an experiment, mm -hmm. and uh, within the first week, we were killing like every. Uh, every record, uh, like I, I made profit records for that company. Uh, I, I completely, um, man, reimagined, reengineered you were how we designed oh, yeah. every aspect of it, man. And the thing is, like, if you think about this, and every I had, all my guys had, had iPads because hey, we're not doing paper anymore, we're, uh, we're going digital. So, we're, I mean, we did think com completely uh, uh, out of the box, it was really, really cool. This episode is brought to you by Agat Sports. Agat Sports is an up-and-coming brand ready to equip you with the tools you need to make your world a better place. Shop at agatsports.com to browse through their diversified catalog of drinkware and clothing wear. What was really interesting about it, if you think about it, mm -hmm. um, we're doing 100% digital, 100%, uh, you know, no paper, then who's going to embrace that? It's the youth. Mm -hmm. The youth started embracing that, so so then that started getting its own you know fame, and I had uh, so I ended up building just an amazing team. We called it the Dream Team because I knew <laughs> it sounds like a dream <laughs> yeah. Team. yeah yeah because I knew I had one foot out the door. It's like man, I have this vision to get into this private equity. Gotcha. And because that's really was really intriguing me right now. Yeah, you're already. I was already looking at the, at the next. So next what I did is, is I, yeah, and, and what I did is I focused on building the next generation and a couple of generations thereafter. So I started creating programs of training. I was like, man, so hey, we're killing the budget on this. Mm -hmm. Let's take advantage and improve everybody in this team, dude. I uh, old, you know, not not old, but you know, like like crusty construction workers. Right. Uh, we, we would sit in a room like this. And it could be 20 of us, 25 in this room, and I would I would tell everybody, hey, make sure you leave your ego at the door, and and say, and, and, right. and I would visualize, hey, like remember you taking it, like a coat off and you're hanging, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're hanging it, I like that, yeah, yeah and and I mean, think about it like that. Nobody talks like that in construction, mm -hmm. and so uh, I had these guys doing that, and whenever they would attack each other because it's highly competitive, mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, uh, did you check that? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, because we all need we need to be vulnerable with each other so we can be able to succeed. Because if I'm struggling and I don't want to say anything because I don't want you to attack me mm -hmm. or see me as weak, then I'm not going to speak up and I'm right. actually going to fail. Right. So I created a man. It, it's really cool, but I, I created a, a, just think about the innovation within manpower, dealing with humans, dealing with labor. Mm -hmm. So all the leaders that I ended up creating there, and, and I wouldn't say I created leaders, I would say more I gave them opportunities. I identified people that, um, that, that had the certain talents or certain recipes mm -hmm. and gave them opportunities. And I fought like hell for those opportunities for them as well. well. I feel like through opportunity, you ended up creating leaders because, um, you know, who knows? And I'm pretty sure these guys, the same way uh, you're, your boss's um, philosophy uh, got worn into, uh, into your life. It probably got into theirs. You know that yeah. just, if you're innovating, if you're a company moving forward, you know breaking all these uh, um, stereotypes and and I guess traditions of um, I'm at a higher level. You know right. type of things. You got to do that, you know, you do got to uh, check your ego and not a lot of people um, get to, um, you know, break away and are able to learn something from the people that are behind them, you know, um, so. Because yeah, you learn from the bottom up, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think a lot of times we think we're still in the 90s where it's top down, the old <laughs> Wall Street corporate models, like, dude, that, that, that's so, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. the 90s, man, that's. You know, we, we need to continue to evolve as humans. We're evolving as a society. So why is it okay for certain uh, societal areas to uh, to evolve, but not others? Like, no, it all has mm -hmm. to go for society to continue to grow. Right. I'm right with it. Yeah. So when did you, um, how was that, that step? 
when did you realize that? It's scary, man. Okay, now I have to. Now it's time for for Jomel to go. Yeah. Into the next step to the, that property. Yeah, it's uh, it was pretty scary because um, I was flipping houses on the side, but that ended up being work. Mm. Uh, it just take it was time consuming, so I was like, uh, I'm not gonna do that. I got to figure what's what's um, less impactful that can can produce a lot of uh, income. And that's why I discovered private equity. And, not, uh, not to cut you off real yeah. quick, you know, for the younger audience, flipping houses, you buy at a, at a rate, you fix it, um, you know, upgrade a, a few things and then sell it at, at, a, high price. at a higher price. Yeah, uh, so uh, exactly, uh, buy a house that needs some uh, repairs, maybe it's outdated, maybe it's the oldest house in your neighborhood, so mm-hmm. you buy that and then uh, renovate it, make it more modern, more appealing and sell it for profit. A lot of obstacles, a lot of hard work, right? A lot of hard work, especially when you have a job, full-time job, mm-hmm. uh, you have to chase contractors. So so in the lunch break, you know, your whole hour lunch break is chasing, you know, uh, uh, and, and on the way to work, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., you're calling contractors, and they're not even awake yet. <laughs> so it's, yeah, uh, but I found private equity to be a, um, it, it, it could scratch all those itches for me where uh, I could still, work as uh, with a team I can create a team uh, lead a team inspire a team mm-hmm. uh, I can also work in construction because uh, uh, in private equity if you buy real estate commercial real estate it needs some renovations or upgrades there mm-hmm. uh, um, so it, it scratched a lot of itches and uh, um, finance I love numbers I love finance and that, that's the the major part of, of that game is uh, is finance so that that's a uh, that's what drew me to private equity. But even within private equity, there's so much to learn, man. Like uh, uh, there's a gentleman, have you heard of Sam Zell? No. Sam Zell created this, uh, he, he was the father of the REITs back in the 70s, uh, uh, real estate investment trust, mm-hmm. where we buy shares into a, a real estate company. Uh, he invented that in the 70s as a solution to uh, a lot of foreclosures in commercial real estate. <clears throat> But uh, uh, he um, he has an awesome book, but he was an inspiration. Uh, um, Stephen Schwartzman, the guy who runs Blackstone, created and runs Blackstone, one of the largest real estate REITs in, in the world, if not the largest. Uh, you know, th- those are books that really inspired me. What's cool about those guys is that they are also out-of-the-box thinkers and innovators and mm. uh, you know, it's not your typical um, corporate Wall Street Right. story where these guys had all this money like no these guys made themselves Sam Zell was a biker man there, there's one thing about uh, reading about all these uh, journeys about these guys and everything you know even uh, some of the books that uh, I've, I've received from you you know uh, I think you put me on um, the, the first one I can think of was uh, the, uh, I forgot the title of it but it's a it's a good day to uh the Rick Ross uh, book was the first oh, one that, yeah, yeah, that you put yeah, me yeah. on. Yeah. Rick Ross, that, that, that's a, a sneaky good one too. Yeah, I I was hesitant when I saw Rick Ross. Like, what? I didn't know much about it, but when I started um, reading about it, um, then I jumped to the next book, um, How to uh, Outwit the, Out the Devil. The Winning Devil is an awesome Yeah, and then that's what, yeah. <laughs> So it's like it starts opening your mind and you start thinking, you know, it's like, where am I? Like, the whole world just looks different. You know, yeah. when you start just getting all this information, uh, you know, going through the internet and, and, and exploring, like, different aspects of, of you get life. Clarity. Exercise. You get clarity of where you want to go mm-hmm. from learning from these things, from these books. Exactly. So, I can understand um, how it was probably, you know, you being uh, the electric engineer, the innovator, all this hard work that you put into this company, and then, okay, I think it's time to... Uh, to jump in yeah. yeah and the thing is that um, uh, in, in my particular route I did the college then your W2 job which you're supposed to basically go until you die until you retire right uh, and there's nothing wrong for people that want to do that that's cool uh, and, and in my case I didn't want that I mm-hmm. wanted a little bit more freedom uh, uh, because even though I had a long rope a long leash Every once in a while they tug on it, they let you know that, gotcha. hey, you're, you're still in yeah, you're, <laughs> you don't run this place. <laughs> Contrary to what you think, you don't run this place. <laughs> it's like, um, 
Don't get ahead. Yeah. You still have a collar. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I wanted to get out, and um, so I started studying books on on that. Uh, right. And it's always, hey, you you save X amount of dollars, so you save six months or a year or whatever that you can bet on yourself. Uh, so I tried to do that, and I could never do it. So I just said, fuck it, man, I'm out. I'm just gonna cut the cord and figure it out. With two kids, <laughs> a wife, a mortgage, yeah. So uh, uh, I love Pizza City. She's supportive, one hundred percent. Yeah, man. yeah. And that's the beauty of um, that's the beauty of having a good relationship or a great relationship with your spouse, with your partner, because uh, they're ultimately your partner in every aspect of life, and you need that support. You need to be a team at home. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to support each other and each other's dreams. And once, uh, once one of you is locked in on something that's, hey, th that, that's where we need to go, both of you need to be on board to materialize mm -hmm. it. And, uh, and she was definitely on board uh, for me, like 100%. Uh, without her support, there's no way I would have, uh, number one, been able to do it. Number two is, is now it feels like it's been here 10 years and wow. I'm comfortable. I, that's, that's, I'm innovating in this space, but... Yeah, it's uh, having that that partner, man. That that was huge. That's and that that sounds great, and that's really important for uh for everyone. Probably you know if you're too young, you probably don't have that partner yet. But um, when you get into that uh, I I, I guess that uh that time, you know, to to be looking, those are different um key things that you would want. You don't you don't want. Not to put it out there like a headache or something like that or somebody that's gonna you know push you back well, I, that's still on you though I, I believe it's still on you because um, uh, yeah you, you have to determine you have to be so one of the things that we do when we date right is that we lie we say hey, look at me I'm this guy um, yeah this is how I yeah, it's all trying time to impress <laughs> yeah. it's time to impress you're not your you're not who you really are and uh, I think that's a shame you should really always be your true authentic self mm. and uh, uh, because that could save those headaches in the future mm -hmm. of hey man no I was really I've always been an entrepreneur mindset and it's just like no I want the safety of a W2 then you have you right. know, diverging interests whereas if yes. you were just had the same page from day one man and you'd be a power couple and understand it's not for everyone and vice versa you know you could be the one that wants that security exactly and your spouse is the one that um that has that entrepreneur mindset and you pretty much uh, understand you know where each other is at and keep doing it doesn't mean that they have to be a part of it set. as long as they support you that's that's uh, absolutely key man like uh i hear it all the time uh well not all the time but i, I do hear like uh spouses that are like totally different wavelengths mm -hmm. like hey the guy uh, does his thing uh, guys time or mm -hmm. completely separate you know like it's almost like they have two lives you know the, the wives do this and then they go out and ladies night or ladies weekends or whatever right. and uh, but they live like two different people in, in a house and um, that that's a shame as well man because uh, uh, man this is the person that you're gonna be with for the rest of your life and uh, you gotta do whatever it takes to like to commit. You know, I think mm -hmm. I think we have a, a serious commitment issue, you know, in, in in our society, man. Like commitment to studies, commitment to working out, commitment to eating right, commitment to relationships, mm -hmm. commitment to goals. Yeah, and I, I feel like uh, much of that obviously um, has to do with the uh, the options. You know, there, there's so many. Not even options. Options is not the right word. Distractions. Yeah. You know, uh, the uh, good analogy to have is, man, you and I know, especially from Puerto Rico, you know, um, you're young and you turn on the TV, what do you have? You kind of say, a cuadro, and that's it. Yeah. Three channels. Cartoon is here. Watching Looney Tunes. The news is here. Watching the news. El chisme, uh, watching the novelas de Rafael again, and, and that's it. Now, when things get better, if they do, and then you start getting, you know, this providers, whatever, with a thousand channels, and you're like, what do I want to watch on TV? Versus, you know, you already knew what to do. Yeah, because you have no goal, you have no GPS coordinate. Like, exactly. What do you want? You have no, no purpose. Exactly. So you almost have to, like, teach yourself 
you know, bring it back to, to um, the, the subject. You almost have to like teach yourself like, you know what? I want to do investing or I want to do this, I want to do that. I don't care whatever is going on around me. I'm just going to keep fo focusing on this, focusing on this. I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. This is my niche, my, my, uh, my area of, uh, of expertise. Um, that, that's, that's what I want to be good at. I'm going to attack this. You know, and not be scattered in, in, in. So let me ask you this: uh, Do you think that sports played a role in, uh, in in creating that, or sports help? Right. Um. Definitely. Um. I feel like, you know, through sports, um, we, you know, the the journey, you know, coming through uh through all these obstacles. The set of, of sacrifices, um, uh, the dedication that you know you have a routine that you have to go by, and especially in in, in my experience in track and field, you know a routine is not um, go to the baseball field for two or three hours or, and do this and that or go to the basketball court. You know my body is twenty four seven training. You know when I sleep, it is part of training because I need to recover. When I uh, well, when I eat, as part of my nutrition. So even on my days off, it's part of my job. So I, my job never stops, you know. And that um, applies into the distractions that probably, um, obviously, as, as life goes on, you get less because um, the but you're, but you're focused on the goal. You're focused, you're, you're focused on, on, the, on the goal, which is where I'm going. To, which is uh, where I'm going in high school. Yeah, and all these calls. Yo, we're going to the movies. Yo, we're going to uh, uh, we're going club. Yo, we're, we're we're doing this. We're doing that. We're doing this. And guess what? You know what you want to do in life. You know what the goal. You know that the long term goal is. And thinking about that track and field uh, dedication, every rest that you didn't take, it's gonna hit you back. You know during that workout. That workout's gonna be extra hard when you come back the next week. So it's like. All of that translated into um, that mentality that um, no matter what um, is is going on in my life, if I want this um, to work, you know, my business, my uh, uh, all these things, then um, the same discipline has to apply the, the every same aspect of life. Discipline, yeah, and it's it's even harder because um, when when you own a business. Um, uh, let's say something uh, hard happens in, in the family, you lose a loved one or something like that, the sun's going to come out the next day and you're still the owner of that business. And if you don't take care of that, you know, there's no day off. Yeah. The same way with track and field, the sun's going to come out the next day. Hey, you lost. You got to mourn. You got to mourn the track. You got to do that workout still because that guy in Germany, that guy in England, he's still working hard. Same thing with business. Worse when you have employees. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they need to feed their family. I'm you sorry. To show up for them. Exactly. You gotta show up. So I feel like for me the transition was, you know, it was pretty much parallel worlds, almost the same. Um, Set goal, achieve goal. Mm -hmm. I think if I, uh, a lot of our uh, a lot of people in society, man, it's not even the youth. Like we gotta stop blaming young people, you know, older generations as well don't have goals they're just going through life you know and uh, uh, and I think also like the word goal when we start talking about that there's a taboo as well like hey every first of the year I set the goals and then by the 31st I quit mm -hmm. like, no, it needs to be bigger man like uh, we, we, we we call them milestones in my house we do milestones and so oh, like, yeah. yeah we're trying to hit trying to hit certain uh, metrics certain milestones uh, and it's quarterly but every everything you know gets translated down to the day, so uh, uh, it, it's not about uh, like having this, this this crazy ass discipline. It's it's just having just having a goal to achieve, just having a uh, metric that you want to achieve, mm -hmm. um, and it, because it's an, it's important to know where you are going, so you know how to get there. Right. So, so if you don't know what you want to be, or you don't know where you want to be, mm -hmm. then how the hell are you going to get there? And it's important to have uh, the little uh, victories, 
and celebrate them. You know, I don't do that, I don't do that enough, man. That's right. Cool. So and because because I I also agree with the with the philosophy that uh, it's the journey. You know, uh, sometimes we're we're too focused on uh, growing up our babies, which are our own companies. It's like another child, pretty much. And you forget that you probably had uh, that family member right there that maybe in two or three years is not gonna be there. And you could have, you know, probably spent some more time with them, you know, before, um, while you, you were heading towards that direction. Yeah. So you could have that milestone of hitting this mark um, for, the, for that business. But then it's also good to have a, a three month milestone or a two month milestone. And when you hit it, it's like, okay, we got it. Yeah. Or, or, or one or two, three, three workouts this week. You know, it's, hit, exactly. Hit, hit that milestone. Exactly. Yeah. Um, as far in track and field, uh, you know, I always took it. Um, I have a daily um, goal, uh, a weekly goal, a uh, three month goal, the yearly goal, and then the ultimate goal. You know, that's that's what I did and uh, what I, what I actually do, and I, I've always done uh, in, in track and field. You know, and you can, tr- you can translate that right into life. Exactly. With exactly. with business, with your health, with your relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, because remember, life is is this wheel. Mm-hmm. You got to hit everything. Now, it's uh, uh, I think the fun part of it is uh, like I don't believe in balance. But I believe in, in ebbing and flowing, you know, right. and uh, you can't just be redlining on one and then everything else just starts dropping. You got to kind of play this game. Like where, Bruce Lee, be like water. Be like water, <laughs> exactly, man, exactly. Uh, but in every as- every area. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so there's a season for everything, right? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Just, um, you know, also have your goals, have your uh, your milestones, but... Uh, Take things how how it is, you know. You you understand where you're headed, so you, you got the direction. You learn from the past, but a lot of people right now are missing out what's in front of them. Yeah. What's happening now, and what's happening now is going to dictate where you're headed to. So you know. So interesting. This podcast is sponsored by Track Check. Track Check is a running store in Central Florida with a long range of running shoes and clothing wear. Track Shack is also host of numerous 5Ks and half marathons throughout the year in the Central Florida community. Learn more at trackcheck.com. And uh, in, in, in that aspect is, uh, like, I'm passionate to reach out to athletes and artists uh, and entrepreneurs to, to start creating wealth and start investing. Uh, that's why we created our funds. Uh, and it, 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 that's our target because uh, I, I see... Uh, a lot of athletes that are looking at the now and not looking at the tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when they retire or move on from their career, then all of a sudden now they're scratching and have to work mm-hmm. construction jobs to make ends meet, or right. you know they go through these things and uh, and artists as well. And uh, I, uh, I'm really passionate about about reaching out to that particular um, uh, section of people. I, I met a um, I mean, I have an incredible privilege. Uh, it, I don't know. I, I have a really blessed life, man. But I had I had the incredible incredible privilege to be working with an NFL player uh, who's a two time MVP. Wow. And he he's since re- retired, uh, but we're getting in, we're getting him in funds now and, and be able to in, invest in, in commercial real estate specifically mm-hmm. in this case. But. Um, what was interesting is uh, he's a 40 year old man, incredibly successful on the football field. And how we met is because um, he had never been taught anything about investments. Really? And uh, we were introduced and all I could talk about was commercial real estate and and, uh, because I love talking about economy and and, Mm -hmm. and, and those things. And then he, he was like, hey, wait a minute. I want to get into apartment complexes because I heard that's where the wealth is. Right. Yeah. And so what was interesting was, um, and I, I, I felt kind of bad because I'm like, okay, so this NFL player, two-time MVP, doesn't have resources. Like people aren't teaching them hmm. uh, to invest or to think about the future. And uh, and so that and that was a, a sobering moment for me. It was like, man, I. I gotta continue to work with you. Now that I'm working with you, I'm gonna reach out to more people 
uh, it's why I'm passionate, always talking to you about investments and, and, right. and, and growth and all that because um, you know I believe that athletes and artists are kind of like a forgotten, like it, it's cool, like, like you're, you're great entertainment, like we're gonna, we're gonna cheer for you, mm-hmm. And then once you're out, we're gonna move on to the next guy, you know. And it's like, wait a minute, like, yeah. Because if, if you think about it, you know, um, think about the the regimen pretty much that that I told you, um, you know, that that uh, that I have, you know, twenty four seven, it's part of work. Even on my day off Sunday, recovery is part of that um of uh of that regimen. So pretty much, the athletes and probably artists, um. All you do, all you know is work. You know, all you know is your art. Focus yeah. exactly your art, your art form. Yeah, which uh, and and who's telling you about investing? You know, and and you think like you don't, you don't even put that in your mind. No, and if you think back through uh, the generation before us, um, the blueprint was the same. Nothing about investing. Yeah, you save know. and then that dollar got eaten away by inflation. It's completely worthless. Uh, you know, and, and inflation is not going anywhere, man. Because uh, uh, at the time of this recording, the United States we have a debt, and we have an, uh, an interest rate on that debt. Well, our, int- our uh, inflation has to be above that so that it's prof- profitable. So we're not actually losing money paying our uh, mm-hmm. our, our obligations. So the United States economy, the economists, they're incentivized to keep the inflation up. So we have this false illusion that inflation is going to come back down, things are going to go back. There's, there's no, no new normal. Uh, like even, even residential real estate. Residential real estate right now is, uh, there's less inventory, it's harder, you know, interest rates have gone up. It's harder for, uh, for people to get mortgages, but yet prices continue to go up. And uh, there was a, a study that just got released a couple of weeks ago that, that showed where residential real estate was going to continue to rise at an approximate 6% clip for this next 12 months. Oh. It was like, then who's buying? And if you really pay attention, you see a lot of institutions like you mentioned Blackstone, Equity Residential, these big REITs, they're building brand new uh, housing developments like with Lennar and, and, and those guys, and, and they're just buying every house. And Orlando's going crazy. And, and, but a lot of these institutions are buying these houses. Wow. So the regular person isn't buying. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they have this great reset that they talk about mm-hmm. uh, uh, that by 2030, by 2032, 2035, it's going to be a 100%, 100% uh, renter's nation where everything is rented. And right now we're seeing it with streaming music, everything is rented. Streaming uh, video, everything is mm-hmm. rented. Your cell phone, every two years, is rented. Every two years, everything is going on rent. Mm-hmm. And you're, there's no ownership. There's no equity. Mm-hmm. And I have a theory where, um, uh, you know, if you, if you see wealth as energy, there's a, there a ball of energy in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And then all of a sudden uh, technology came in and the youth started grabbing at that wealth bubble, mm-hmm. that wealth energy. It started bringing some of the energy down to people that don't look like Wall Street, don't talk like Wall Street, mm-hmm. the Zuckerbergs of the world, you know, uh, uh, and, and it started bringing this wealth down to the youth. And I believe like there's this energy going and it's trying to push the wealth back up to where it was. Mm-hmm. It's like this big regulation that's happening. And uh, uh, so another reason why for me it's so important to have these private equity, uh, these private equity funds and, and investments because we have to own something because if you own something an investment puts money into mm-hmm. your into your pocket sure. if you own something that's that's worthy then that's going to continue to go up in value and so does your net worth so does your net value now you can pass that wealth on generationally uh, so but you can only do that by owning right and you have to own yeah. equity there i feel like that's that's really important you know and uh and Really important stuff that that uh, that should be um, common uh, knowledge out there, uh, especially for the uh, younger uh, generation, the 20 to uh, 25 year olds that I've seen in these previous years. A lot of them are moving towards entrepreneurship, and I didn't see that um, back then. Obviously, yeah. me myself included. Um, a bunch of my high school friends. 
uh, they own businesses, you know, from in different aspects. Some are, uh, uh, they, they have their own test, testing uh, business, some have their own uh, uh, retail shop, you know, so, and some even uh, own restaurants. So, there, the fire is lit. In, yeah. in there is that, an awakening. Yeah, the, I feel like there's an awakening that wasn't there before because everyone young was pretty much pushed into the workforce. Um, you know, and only if you had uh, an insight or you came from a prominent uh, family, then you were pushed to, towards that uh, entrepreneurial uh, right. route. Now, as far as uh, you know, that that young generation, and if they wanted to get into uh, investments um what, what's your insight in that how could a young person that graduated you know in the same spot that you were um looking for jobs looking um for uh for that opportunity of investing how could they get into invest or is that maybe something for somebody a little older you know you graduated well, yeah. college 23 so so we had a, so this is not financial advice Right, I got uh, I'm just a dude that lives in Orlando. Yeah, and and I was like, what's doing else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm off the wall. So I believe that um, uh, you need to invest in what you know. You need to know what you're investing in. Like for example, I, uh, a lot of friends that went into crypto, and then crypto crashed, lost all their shit, and then you know, now they're sad. And it's like, well, did you did you know anything about the, the space? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think 401ks are also out the door, man, because mm. uh, 401k, um, I mean, I think they're phasing out. They're, it, it's outdated. Uh, and, and why is it that I can't, t- I can't touch my wealth until I'm 65? You know, it's like, it should be mine. I should be able to have access to it. Right. So I think there's, there's a lot of archaic um, investment uh, vehicles that are out there. Uh, first and foremost is the knowledge. Like, educate yourself on what you're, what you're investing in. Know what you're investing in. Uh, but uh, what I what I like about the funds that we offer up is uh, we go with the economic cycles. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before we, we started right. talking, and um, it, it, because in the last ten years it's just been an up. Mm-hmm. We have no idea what a down looks like. Well. We're on the down. We just don't know. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I, I, I would joke that the meteor hit, but the dinosaurs don't know yet. You know, they just kind of looked up and they're just still eating, hanging out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so it's important, I believe, for uh, to always be saving and investing, saving and investing, investing in in, in funds, because in in the world that we live in now, you have all this access. You can you can invest in different funds. You can save up 50k, for example, and then put 25 in this fund over here, 25 in this real estate fund. You have a, a stock portfolio fund, but uh, like ETFs. But you can do this on your own. You don't need. Uh, again, this is not financial advice. No, no, no. Yeah, you, you don't need a. Uh, uh, I don't think you need one of these 401k advisors, and, and some of them are great friends. But uh, uh, I, I just believe we're in a different age and time where. Mm-hmm. I can now read about your business. I can read about your success. Right. You know, uh, you, you can you can research me and, and see my track record and where I'm going and what I'm building and what I'm about. You can do that with the shortsmen's of the world. You can do that with all the different funds and fund managers. I think that's the key, man, because uh, as athletes, artists, entrepreneurs, or even just high net worth individuals, you start as an engineer, you work your way up, eventually you're making six figures and then way into six figures. So you should be saving and deploying that capital uh, into into some fund, some storage, some investment vehicle that you know. Uh, like I like to I like to invest a, a large amount of, of my income, so uh, 40, 50 percent annually. I throw it somewhere, uh, and I think that should be something that you rinse and repeat as an artist, as, a, as an Athlete, as an entrepreneur, or I know with individual, I think you you make your money mm-hmm. and then you just you park it, you, you store it, right. so that it grows on its own. So versus from parking it in the in the bank, yeah, that inflation's you, gonna get you at the bank, man. Right. Inflation's gonna eat your dollar value. So that dollar uh, that so uh, once upon a coconut, our friends here, uh, if one can used to be a, a, a dollar, now it's two dollars. Well, mm. your savings didn't 
it didn't grow mm -hmm. it just sat there so that dollar now is just got cut in half and, and that's what's happening that that's basically inflation just keeps dropping the value so unless you unless your money right. is unless your benjamins are having little baby baby benjamins <laughs> then uh you're not investing so you're keep, losing basically keep your money moving keep it moving keep it growing right yeah. and all these funds have different um i guess time frames yeah you know you could you returns uh, on investments risk profile everything is risk so everything in life is risk and uh um, i learned this later in life but uh everything is risk you don't bet the farm on every, on anything really uh that's high risk the, um crypto and i'm not disparaging crypto uh i'm a fan but it, to invest a ton of your uh resources into that it's high risk, you know, and, and everybody thinks about the high reward, man, but that's a high risk. Mm -hmm. You work hard for this cash, yeah. you know, and uh, um, I, I think you have to, you always got to be risk averse. In the last four or five years, for example, I was all in on apartment complexes, multifamily in the Southeast, and I had, uh, I have niches within niches. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think that's the key is not be exactly like everybody, try to find niches. So in the last four or five years, I, was, I had this specific niche and so we grew the, the, the uh, we grew our wealth for our investors, and we rode that wave. But you know it crested, and mm -hmm. like again the meteor hit, but, but we don't know that it's hit yet. Right. So people think that it's still uh, that's still because it worked, and they're seeing a lot of copycats. Hey, it worked. Let's all do this. Like mm -hmm. wait a minute, you guys are about to get hurt because maybe by that time it's already too late. It's already too late. So now back then you could take some risks. You know, like uh, we had. Uh, one of our first deals, like we almost three x our investors' capital. So if, if you put in a hundred grand with us, we give you back three hundred. Wow! And that's that's a home run. Mm -hmm. That's not every day, but that's as you're riding the wave up. And then the the returns get a little bit smaller. Then next like fifty percent was the next deal, and then twenty five percent, and then it's not, that's you know you're cresting. And now that you're crested, you you take smaller risks. Instead mm -hmm. of shooting for those home runs or those line drives, you just try to smash those line drives. Now we go into preservation mode. Now we go into the Coliseum with no lions. This is just the Coliseum yeah, exactly. to protect our wealth. But this, you put the lions there mm -hmm. to make your uh, your wealth bulletproof. Gotcha. And that's uh, coincidentally what we're calling our uh, our next venture. But uh, it, yeah, when when things start falling, you want to protect your wealth. Mm -hmm. And you still want it to continue to, to grow modestly, but you're just taking the risk off the table. Gotcha. So now that yeah, you, you focus on the on the investments that have less risk, but le the less reward. So you, you, you're probably not going to see double digits, right? But yeah, at least going to be protected, right? And and that's what you want. So you want you want to ride. Uh, that's that's that is the the the, the definition of buy low, sell high. And it's because it's how you play. You understand that money is a game, wealth is, is a game, just like life is a game. We talked about mm -hmm. goals and, and that's part of the game. If, if you're not hitting these things, then uh, you're losing the game because you're at getting adversely affected. It's the same thing, same thing with, with wealth, same thing with the economic cycles. So you, you want to ride the growth up and then get out of the growth and then protect down, protect, protect, protect. And as you, as you, you pass halfway, point now you start looking to buy again and then you buy and then you ride it again and then you and that's how you do it, your risk profile we, we take our risk and we increase our risk on the bottom and on the way up and then we start shrinking it and then you know then just kind of open it back mm -hmm. up wow that's that's really interesting like and that's the key though man because because yeah. that's how you're going to make i mean to cut you off brother but that's yeah, how you yeah. that's that's how you make your wealth and you preserve your wealth you know, like these aren't things that that it's commonly talked about, but it should be. These aren't things that are taught in schools, but it should be. Mm -hmm. These aren't things that are taught in our in our family gatherings, but they should be. You know, and uh, uh, I, I have some friends that whenever we get together to have beers or whatever, I'm always talking. What are you investing in? What are you doing now? You know, I care about what you're doing with your money, and it's not it's not going to make me wealthy. I want you to be wealthy. Right. We talked earlier about abundance, mm -hmm. and it's like, man, if you're Abundant, abundantly set up and your family's abundantly set up man that means that you can take your, your future generations and, and put them in a stratosphere man you can you can you can set your family up to, to impact society 
in a different way, man. Because if you don't have to worry about your bills in the future or if your investments are taking care of these things, you're going to be a better member of society. So at the end of the day, that's you know that that's what we're striving for. What are key aspects that um or hints that tip you that where the economy the economy is uh, headed? Is it just all in your in your numbers? If your numbers are starting to start stagnating, that's when you start um yeah. it's making kind of, the move. There's a lot of little metrics. So like in the uh, multifamily space, you look like you look at something called absorption, which is basically uh, how many units are available versus how many people are, are filling them up and how quickly. Uh, so if an apartment complex has 300 units and 100 units are available, then you know it's a bad time, it's low. Mm. If it's up at 99% occupied, so out of 300, 299 are, are occupied, then you're like, man, things are good, then you keep pushing rents up. That's what pushes rents up, by the way. Mm. You, so you push rents up to the point where you start having a separation of that uh, vacancy rate and then uh, and then you, you kind of bring it back down to try to normalize that so you're looking at these metrics like absorption uh, but you're also paying attention you're paying attention to defaults what is the default rate you know right now we're all-time high consumer debt credit cards are all-time high mm. should be a red flag auto loans are all-time high that should be a red flag defaults on both those aren't all-time high so okay so those were red flags houses we talked about the mortgage rates earlier the houses are continue to go up ridiculously mm -hmm. you know like uh when our parents and our grandparents bought houses uh like the money relative this 300 grand house relative to their salary they probably made 150k salary relative but the house then was probably i don't know 100k and they're making 50 a year so like think about the relativity but now it's like it's so disparate it's like it's a whole different game it's a bad time yeah, but uh, you're looking for these markers. You're always looking for these markers. So when, what are when are things getting stressed? You're seeing commercial uh, office spaces right now, office building going fully vacant, mm -hmm. foreclosing left and right. I've noticed that. But what, what what's with these neighborhoods coming out of the blue, left and right? You know, it's because. Let's talk Once Upon a Coconut. Once Upon a Coconut is a low-calorie, 100% pure coconut water drink with no added sugars or sweeteners, non-GMO and gluten-free. They have different variants like pineapple, coconut, and chocolate. Take a peek at onceuponacoconut.com. As we live in, uh, uh, there are certain parts of several communities or states in the country where because of a lot of the work from home, mm. people are leaving the offices and now they can work and live wherever they want. So why not come to a, a state like Florida, <clears throat> no income tax, and the weather is amazing. Uh, and so that's, that's where we're seeing an influx. So it, it continue to look at the data. Everything is data. So cities like New York City, people are leaving the city. Wealthy are buying what people are leaving uh, behind, but uh, they're moving down to these states. That's what we see communities everywhere. And that's what you're seeing institutions like we mentioned Blackstone and mm -hmm. We mentioned uh, equity residential and, and homes for rent, which is another huge, you know, multi-billion dollar REIT. And they're buying whole communities and renting them out to all these people coming in. Wow. Yeah. So we just happen to live uh, in a very interesting place where we're seeing this. But if you go to other places. It's unique to Florida. It's unique to Florida. The situation is unique to Florida. You, yeah. You go to other states or other, uh, other markets and it's, it's a whole different, it's like a different time zone. It's, it's, it's almost like you have to keep your eyes open. And your ears open while you're doing um, the um, you're investing. You're, you're investing. Yeah, yeah. yeah you wanna uh, you, you wanna look for these markers, man. And uh, and and Jim Rohn talks about a lot about the uh, or talks a lot about the law of polarity. You want to see both sides of mm -hmm. the spectrum too, because some people could be doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, and then you think it's all doom and gloom, and you missed out on on over here. It's like no, it actually wasn't. They were exaggerating. So you always want to see both sides. So when you see something that uh, that looks like a potential bad marker, try to find the uh, the opposite of that. Are there reports that are finding something different? Because you might be you might get surprised and find a niche within that, um, yeah. or doom and gloom is correct, and you got to sell out of these positions and get into a different position. Right. And do you think things come back like? You said you were doing uh, multifamily, and then yeah. now you're doing commercial. You think multifamily might come back? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when something is really popular, that's when you start worrying. Uh, for example, the multifamily space. Once every 
body, every institution, every mom and pop, every person that had a little bit of cash, all these doctors, dentists, everybody's buying multifamily, running these prices up. Then you realize, hmm, time to pivot. Time to, like it's getting saturated. It, they're they're artificially inflating prices. Let's see what's gonna happen. And so you let that crest out, and then and then just like crypto, that people that lose everything, they just bailed it because they don't know crypto. Mm -hmm. So they're out. They're gone forever. <clears throat> so once those guys leave, you just ride that wave again. It's just man, it's just a, it's just a cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like in, in uh, economic cycle, we talked earlier about how we, um, you know we've been riding ten years of just straight up. We mm -hmm. don't know what down is. Right. What down is here, uh, and and we just got to figure out what is your next move to protect you and protect your family and protect the wealth and protect your positions that you have. Great stuff, Dumel. Thank oh, you. Man.